Hey, what's up, guys? My name is Ashona. Welcome back to the Game Engine series. Thursdays is Game Engine series day, Hazel 2D day, or at least Thursdays in like Australian time. That's why today I started the day off with doing a four hour live stream, four hours, 16 minutes, just working on Hazel 2D and figuring out what we're doing this episode. This is every Thursday, every Thursday on Twitch or TV slash the channel. Definitely check that out if you're interested in a little bit more of a deeper look into what actually goes into like, you know, Hazel 2D um, and every kind of, I guess every decision that's made by me, every problem that I suffer through, all of the debug stuff, because what I do is I basically live stream everything on Twitch, like I've been doing every Thursday. This is the second consecutive Thursday and I made it. So, you know, we're going strong. Um, but basically this is what we are going to be taking a look at today. It's gonna be based entirely off of this live stream. I've already kind of got the code written. And furthermore, after the code is basically done, I push it onto the public Hazel repository in the dev branch. You can see literally just straight out of that four hour live stream, I'm now recording this, this episode. So it really truly is game engine day or game engine series day. But anyway, the point is that um, all of the stuff that I produce out of that live stream, usually I will push that into this branch. So if you want like to be a little bit closer involved with the development of Hazel 2D, definitely check out both the Hazel repository, this dev branch, right? But then also the actual Twitch live stream where I will be streaming every Thursday. They just wanted to kind of give a little bit like of, of a reiteration as to where we're at and how the, how the development's actually going. Now, that being said, another great kind of thing to come out of this is that I can kind of show you guys what we'll be achieving in today's episode ahead of time. I mean, I'm sure you could just jump to the end and, and take a look at it. But if we actually dive in into Hazel and take a look at, um, you know, what is in that dev branch currently and the code that we have, you know, we've gone from basically just being able to, uh, you know, render a pink cube, hit play, we can see it, to now actually having like physics where we can hit play and you can see we actually have like box 2D physics running. So that all happened, like we went from zero to that, to this working in like four hours, right? And that was all live streamed. Um, of course I had, you know, big boy Hazel, Hazel 3D, Hazel Dev, whatever. I had that for reference. Um, and that's kind of how I built that stuff. But again, point being, if you want to see that whole process, head on over to Twitch, cause this is gonna be a condensed version where I'm gonna do it for the second time, but now in front of you guys and hopefully maybe even explain a little bit more. So without further ado, let's dive in and take a look at what it's gonna take to make that stuff happen. I just feel energized today, to be honest, because again, just done so much, so much stuff. Um, there's actually a few other things that went into it that I'm not gonna talk about, right? But I am mostly going to be using this as like kind of like a diff so that I can actually see what's going on um, because obviously the all of the changes are kind of here and we're gonna kind of start with that. But the first thing I'll do is actually uh, check out a copy of the master branch, I think. Okay, so what I have here is a completely fresh checkout of the master branch, but it looks like it doesn't even compile. And so I wanna talk a little bit about this because I went through this on stream and I think it was kind of, uh, it probably will be useful to some people. So first of all, why doesn't it compile? It's a fresh checkout. Yeah, it doesn't compile, uh, surprisingly, not my fault, um, because people seem to have like accepted pull requests without even checking to see if it like compiles or whatever. I think the problem is um, this, actually it is this. So this log.h file uh, now includes stringcast from GLM and that's like a GTX thing. The, uh, anything in GTX is like uh, experimental as far as I'm aware. So um, it's good that we have these operators now, it's fine, but again, it doesn't compile because you have to enable the experimental thing. Now. You can just look at the kind of log, I guess, and see what's changed recently if you knew that it did compile at some point. But I'll show you how to kind of diagnose an issue like this because it can be annoying. So what does the output say? Well, the output says there's a fatal error. GLM, GDX, dual quaternion is an experimental extension, blah, blah, blah. If you double click on this, you get taken to dual quaternion.hpp and then we see, we see the error. It's just a hash error. The compiler is giving us an error because this is not defined. So we need to define this somewhere. But how do we even know what's pulling in this header file? So the way that I like to do this is first of all, you need to figure out like what you're trying to compile that doesn't compile this, right? So if we look at like the output, it can be a little bit hard to tell what even tried to happen. But you know, if you look at this build starter project Hazel, it says HZPCH and then immediately the error, right? So most likely it couldn't compile the pre-compiled header. So the next step is to open up the pre-compiled header and just hit control F7 on the CPP file. This is just to confirm that we are in the right place. And you can see that in fact, yes, the pre-compiled header, it's 
this is the physical CPP file that's trying to be compiled and it cannot be compiled because uh, obviously we're getting this hash error. So now we have the tedious issue of like, but but which one of these header files includes that? So easiest way to, to check, at least in my experience, is to go back to that CPP file. Um, and then if you go to properties, right click properties or alt enter as I just pressed, if you go into um, C, C++ and then like, I never know where it is, so I end up going to all options and searching. Maybe it's in advanced. Um, yeah, it is in advanced. So uh, show includes, right? And you can just enable it just for that file. You can enable it for your whole project, but that's unnecessary. So just for this file, we'll enable show includes. We'll set that to yes. And then now when I hit control F7, I'll see the in entire like hierarchy of stuff that's been included. Now, usually it's a bit hard to deal with here. So I can just control A, control C that. Um, and then if I open up VS Code, which is a command for some reason, and it's just a bit weird. But if I open that up, let me just try and get a blank thing going. Um, and if I paste that in here, now I have this text here and it's a bit easier to deal with. I can find the file that's causing the error, which is, I think it's this one, Jill Quaternion, but I can make sure by just double clicking it. Yeah, so it is jillquaternion.hpp. I can find this. Um, jillquaternion.hpp, I can see what's including it, which looks to be it's included once and it's included here. And then I can be really cool with this multi-line thing in, in VS Code and I can just middle click drag up and I'm just trying to basically just form a line to see the first thing, this is great, isn't it? To see the first thing that crosses that line to the left, right? I may have already gone past it. I don't know, I wasn't really looking. Um, so this is this touches it. I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in stuff that's to the left side of it. So apparently nothing yet. Um, let's keep, oh, there we go, right? And then you can see, oh, look. So the first, the file that includes that file, that's what I'm looking for. What file includes that file? It's gtx stringcast.hpp, that's this. What includes that? Oh, look, it's one of our files, log.h. And of course we knew that from looking at the diffs and looking at the actual commits, but log.h is the file. So going back here, going to log.h, we'll obviously see that it includes that string cast as it said in, in the kind of show includes thing over here, right? So then we're like, oh, okay. So including this is the problem. And what is the problem? The problem is that we need to define that um, kind of, well, we have to have that define Jill enable uh, experimental if we wanna be able to actually include it. Now two, there's a lot of ways you could do this. We could stick this in like a pre-compiled header. We could, um, you know, we could uh, actually make the define be part of the pre-make build so that when, whenever we build a Hazel file, it already has that defined. Um, I don't know, to be honest, what it should be. I'm pretty sure we do define this in other places. Yeah, we do it in math.cpp. We do it in a, in a bunch of places. So just for now, I'll just do it here as well. So we'll define that before we include that file. And then the other thing I'll do uh, quickly is I'll actually drop this below this, right? So usually what we do with Hazel is we like to include our files first and then anything external. Just so that, like, just in case we have certain definitions or certain other configurations, pushing warnings, whatever it might be, um, that we actually want to kind of take effect before we actually pull in external code. So usually we do that. Um, um, but yeah, that's pretty much how I would go around, uh, go about fixing and finding the, like where that actually is, where that problem is. Um, because it can be obviously a complete nightmare to be like, oh no, this is being included, but from where, and obviously recursive, like not recursive includes, but includes nested and includes like it's, it can be an absolute nightmare to debug. So that's kind of step one in this episode, <laughs> a little bit annoying, but, um, uh, fixed, uh, you know, um, I guess I'll uh, not being defined in um, fix that not being defined in log dot h um, in recent commit. So yeah, so but just for the future, um, obviously make sure you test you test your pull request. I'm not sure if, how that would have compiled. Um, unless, and, and again, obviously I just did a fresh checkout. I ran set up, I, you know, re did regenerate, I did generate my projects for the first time. So it wasn't something that might've also been in pre-make, like defining that or whatever. So um, make sure code compiles that that's, you know, step one is compiling, step two is running. Try not to fail step one at least. Um, but yeah, so that's the first thing I wanted to mention. Uh, other than that, we can just get right into basically, um, figuring out uh, everything that needs to go into Box2D. So the first thing I wanna start with is, if you guys don't know what Box2D is, it's a 
it's a pretty good, it's a great, I'll say it's a great 2D physics library. You should start with this, right? I have used this for years, so I kind of know how it works. So I'm not going to bore you with this here. I'm not going to teach you Box2D because they have pretty good documentation. Box2D.org slash documentation. Start with the overview, go through this. It literally like just explains everything really well. There's a hello Box2D which goes through how to create a world. You can see how good they have little snippets of source code. It's fantastic. This is how you learn how to do this stuff, right? Um, I would definitely recommend taking a look at this. It's probably good thing for me to read it as well because 2.4.1 don't think i've used that version yet and um you know i'm sure there's a lot of stuff that i didn't read initially and probably some new stuff so start with the documentation for sure but then um obviously we're gonna brush past that <laughs> um the other thing that i like to do that i do with a lot of the sub modules is i fork them so i forked box 2d already um i actually updated this recently i think so um, you can see we're like in sync, we're kind of ahead because we've got our own commits here. But the reason I do this, um, I explained it during the live stream. Uh, I might even, I don't know, might talk about this some other time as well. But uh, the point being uh, is that I like to, I like to fork repositories and put them kind of under my control so that I can freely modify them, not just like add a pre-make file because I want to compile this through pre-make. You can see how easy this script is, right? box is a great example of just being easy to compile. No real problems with the build there. But um, I can just easily make my own pre-make file and add that there so that I can use it with the rest of like Hazel's build system, but also I can modify stuff. So I'm GUI is a great example. We have done a lot of modifications to I'm GUI, um, written custom code, you know, I have fixed bugs in there. Um, that's kind of important to be able to do if you're running a game engine. You don't want to just depend on someone else's repository unless it's really immutable in the sense that like you're never going to be modifying their code. Yeah, you can make them, you can make them directly a submodule. Otherwise, I like to fork it then make the fork a submodule, right? That's what I've been doing this f thus far. So I've already done that. This has been around for a long time, but today, four hours ago, I when I started that live stream, I um, updated it to the latest version so that it was basically in sync with master, right? From the original repository over here. Okay, so that's kind of, um, that's kind of where we sit with Box2D. So that means we can easily just go to our um, repository and just add it as a submodule, right? So git submodule add the URL and then um, Hazel vendor and then box2d. I'll add it with the capitalization like this, hit enter and it's going to, it's going to clone it. Okay, you can see how quick that was actually. I mean, probably not because I cut, but it was, it was like seconds. One other thing I want to mention about forking as well is that a lot of the times these repositories contain so much extra stuff. So like, for example, this test bed, like you know, this, if you look at this, this is like a full on like I am GUI and like, you know, testing like Box2D. I don't need that. It should be part of the main repository, of course, but like I don't need that. Right. So I can just I haven't done it in this case, but I could just delete that from the fork and therefore I'm making like the whole Hazel solution a little bit lighter. Right. I mean, I don't think I'm including that test bed stuff in the build. I'm not just source and include, but still like those files have to be cloned and pulled down. We don't need that. Right. Um, so that's another reason why I like to do this. But anyway, so we've got that submodule. Um, it's set now. Now all we have to do, because again, I've already written the pre-make file for it. This submodule is in use by Big Hazel as well, not just Hazel 2D, um, which is this version that we're working on here, the game engine series. So we've been using it for a while. But um, Hazel Vendor Box 2D, it's here, right? And it's got a pre-make file. So all I have to do is like add it as a as a like I have to include it into my pre-make file and add it as a dependency. So I'll open up dependencies.lua and pre-make 5.lua. So I probably will try and keep them kind of in alphabetical order. Maybe I'll have the lowercase guys first here for whatever reason. Um, I don't know what order to put these in. Like you could try grouping them by categories. Like this stuff is all kind of graphics related. GLM's like math, it's kind of core, I guess. Entity, like shaders, I don't know. I'm just gonna put it up here. Um, workspace location, Hazel vendor, then Box2D. And then Box2D does not does in fact have a, a folder called include, which has all that stuff there. Now we don't need to include the library directory because we're not linking it as an external library. We're actually compiling it ourselves. So because of that, we can just go to premake 5.lua and over here in dependencies, we can just include it. Again, I'll include it kind of in alphabetical order, kind of. And actually, I guess that is in alphabetical order, except for that. But um, box2d is now included, so it should be included in our dependencies over here. Sorry, over here, dependencies. 
Um, but then there's a few other things we have to do to specifically Hazel to actually link the library and also add those include directories that we just defined in dependencies. So if we go to, um, let's see, Hazel, and then look at Hazel's pre-make file, then we can say that we want to link box2d. Again, I'll do it in alphabetical order. Shouldn't matter too much. Um, and uh, the include directory, again, I guess in alphabetical order. So box2d. And I think that's it. I think that's literally it. <laughs> so you can see how easy it is to set this up if you already have that premake file. So now I'll just regenerate those projects again. You can see it's made the box2d stuff. Um, if I hit reload, then I guess the premake files are included in premake. That's kind of nice, right? Yeah, that, that that's nice. I didn't notice that before. Um, anyway, so we have box2d here. Let's right click and hit build, try and compile it. Should compile without problems, I hope. Debug x64. My Visual Studio lately, by the way, has been just a complete disaster. I don't know what's going on. Like, look at it. It's just frozen now. It's just frozen trying to compile stuff. There we go. Finally started the build. And there you go. You can see how quick that was. Of course, with multi processor compile enabled and my like 16 cores, it's pretty quick, but um, that's done. No warnings, no nothing. We have the lib file and it should be linkable and everything should be great. So that is how we add a sub module, really easy stuff. Uh, again, box is quite a simple example. Weren't many source files, nothing really to, you know, it's just math basically <laughs> box city. So it's, it's, it's easy to work with. Okay. So let's pop into this and see what we can do. Um, I'm just going to hit a five to, to run this. Um, it should just link it. I think I added it. Like I didn't forget to add it to the linking, did I? Um, let's compile the rest of the engine. Visual Studio is not responding. I don't know what's going on. Probably need to wipe my computer again or get a new computer because this guy is getting old. Um, anyway, while that's going though, um, let's uh, talk a little bit about our strategy here. So what I want to do is like the idea itself is really easy. And as I mentioned, looking at the documentation is the best, the best way to get started. But what I'm going to do today is specifically just make it like, you know, I'll get it to the state that I showed you in, showed you at the beginning of the episode. Look at this. It's still not responding. What a pile of trash. Anyway, as I mentioned, we'll get it to the state that I showed you in the beginning of the video. But to do that, all we really need to do is basically, I don't think we have in our scene, in our scene class, I don't think we have an actual like entry point that we established, like a runtime start function. In our editor layer, we made that um, on scene play or something like that. We made that function, uh, I think last episode, which I'll have linked up there. By the way, I should have done that. At the, it'll probably be linked since the beginning, be, since the beginning of the episode. But basically, you know, we have that play button, but it needs to actually trigger something in the scene because at that point we actually want to initialize the box 2D world and populate it with all of the rigid body 2D components that we're about to create. And then all of the, you know, box colliders or whatever else we have. So that needs to happen when we hit play. And then obviously every frame on update, we then need to actually simulate that physics world. And then that's basically it. So the way that it works, um, probably worth explaining, actually, I didn't even think about this. I was just going to jam in the code, but I guess if you've never done this before, it might not make too much sense. So let me switch back to my screen again. This is very crude because I didn't prepare for this. We're going to, we're going to just, maybe I can um, fill this with just like black or something and then draw in white so that my screen isn't, so that my um, face isn't overexposed. That's the real reason. Yeah, I guess I can. So basically the way that this works um, in paint is, uh, you know, we have this kind of uh, box 2D world, which contains a representation. So I'll call this box 2D world. This contains a representation of all of the actual physical bodies that we have in our scene. So we call these rigid bodies. They are literally, if you just imagine like, oh, I have, you know, if we look back to that scene that I showed at the beginning of this episode, we have like a box, we have another box. This is like kind of like the floor. This kind of moves around and bounces around, right? So these are both rigid bodies. This one we call a static rigid body because it does not move, right? Or at least it doesn't like, it, it's not really affected by gravity or by physics itself. You can't push this around. Of course, programmatically, you can decide to move it somewhere else, but it doesn't get simulated, right? It basically adds as it acts as like a fixture as like something that's permanently fixed. Now this on the other hand is a dynamic rigid body. Um, in the sense that like when you hit play, it will fall, right? 
If this was also dynamic, the floor would just fall and that would be useless, right? That way this is kind of fixed as being kind of held by imaginary pins. Of course, in the real world, we have like, you know, the earth floating in space. It has a gravitational center. This isn't really the case for box 2D or anything. So that's why we have this concept of static because we need to be able to fix something in space. Otherwise everything moves and that's a disaster, right? So we have these rigid body 2Ds. They also have something called a collider, right? They have to have a collider, which specifies what part of it actually kind of gets uh, sent to the physics system. So the fact that we're rendering this as like a square and a thing, that's all great. But that has nothing to do with like the physical mathematical representation of um, our actual bodies here, right? So usually what happens is, um, you know, physics libraries like box 2D like to deal with half extents. So in other words, you have a position which is basically the center of the object. And then you have a half extent, which is basically kind of like the radius instead of the diameter, right? So it's not the total length of this thing. It's from that, it's from that position point, how long till the edge, right? So in other words, if this was a one by one meter square like this, then obviously you'd have a 0.5 by 0.5 kind of box collider extent right? That would be the size of the box collider, 0 0.5, 0 0.5. So that's how we basically, like this mathematical representation we give to Box2D and then it's able to basically run a simulation, right? So this will fall on that mathematical representation. But then what we want to do is show that. So we need to basically take that back and render that on the screen somehow, right? So how do we currently render things? Well, we use the transform component, right? So we have a, we have a transform that contains like our translation rotation scale, right? That's what we use to actually physically draw this. So if we want to draw it down here now, right? We need to obviously pull that data from box 2D. So in other words, in this case, we'd be pulling, well, you know, this is 2D physics. So we just need the X, Y position, right? Of where it is, there is no Z position, Z is zero. And then we also pull just the Z rotation, right? So in other words, you can't rotate it in 3D space. You can't just suddenly make it kind of lie down like that it's going to be like rotated this way, right? So that's a bad drawing, rotated this way, right? Which is obviously gonna be through that kind of depth, that Z axis. So that's what you need to do. Um, we need to pull that back. So in other words, we first basically, when we hit play, we give Box2D all of these representations, all these mathematical representations. We tell it, hey, this is static. There's a lot of other kind of properties as well, like, you know, the friction of a surface, the bounciness or the restitution of a surface. Like there's a few different other things that, like the density, how heavy is this, stuff like that. You know, we can give it um, way more parameters than just like this is where it's located and that's it. We can give it like physics material properties basically. But at the end of the day, you know, this is just what we're dealing with, right? We're, we're dealing with these parameters that we give to Box2D and that happens when we hit play. Now, every frame we need to update all of these bodies, right? So we basically tell the Box2D world to simulate our physics. And then once it does that, once the simulation has completed, right, we need to actually go through all of the, these Box2D bodies basically and pull this orange data back and apply it to our transform component before we render it. And then we render it and then everything's great. It's been affected by physics. Now there's a few important things to note here, right? Feeling energy. I'm standing still. We're standing during the entire four hour, 15 minute live stream. And I'm still standing. Just have not sat down today. That's that's how that's how into game engine series day I am. But anyway, so the other important thing to note here for sure is that since we are pulling our transform data and overriding our transforms every frame from box 2D, that means the transform component can't really be used anymore. You use it initially to set up where you wanna be in the world, right? Because when we create those bodies in the first place, when we hit play, right? Where does it get the stuff for like where the bodies should be from the transform component? So that still acts, that still works in that regard. But then if we suddenly decide through our C sharp script in the future that we want to move a body, we can't just set its transform because that's not going to do anything. When it gets simulated, it's going to set it to whatever the box2D value is. Useless, right? So instead of doing that, what you need to do, realize is that if you are, if you are a rigid body, if you have that rigid body 2D component, 
right, then you, you are owned by the physics system. That means that if you want to suddenly decide that I want to teleport myself somewhere else into the level during gameplay, you tell Box2D to do that for you, right? Because again, Box2D becomes the authority for the transform essentially of the actual object of the entity. So that's important to note as well. You can't just set the transform, not going to work. You could make it work if you wanted to, if you really wanted that API, I want to set the transform because obviously behind the scenes in the C++ code, you could be like, if the transform is being set from C sharp and I'm a rigid body, then redirect that transform setting to box 2D. You could do that internally, but I find it's a little bit better to just be aware of how it works, I guess. And of course, in your C sharp logic code, you could also be like, if this has a rigid body 2D component, set it that way, otherwise set the transform directly. So whatever. Anyway, that's the plan. Hopefully that explanation was kind of useful. Now we're going to dive in and actually start doing all of the work. So um, this has finally uh, lo loaded, by the way. Um, so if we go to scenes uh, and yeah, we've just got the pink cube here. We hit play, everything works. Um, now we can actually compile and run. That's kind of nice. But of course, we don't have any 2D stuff. So how do we even set something up, right? So if I go control N, I'm going to set up. Uh, and by the way, during the live stream, I was very... Um, annoyed with the fact that there's so many things missing, like we can't duplicate entities. Control S didn't exist during the live stream. I ended up adding it. So we can only save as, we can't even save, right? So I might, I don't know if I'll do that today. I might just merge it in or something. I don't think that's that interesting. Uh, but basically, if we create a, a kind of sprite render entity, our first goal, I'll create, um, I'll call this our sprite, right? I'll create a uh, camera as well, call it camera. And this camera, the first goal of the camera will switch it to like perspective. And then I think we'll just pull it back a bit. Now, if I hit play, you should see that. That's great. So now we're going to save as, and we're going to go into assets, scenes, and we're going to call this the same thing it was in the dev branch, physics2d.hazel, done. Um, so now if I go to, uh, you know, pink cube, and then go back to here, you can see that it saves my scene and everything works. Wonderful. I want to make this fall. That's step one, right? If it's really part of the box 2D world, when I hit play, it should fall, right? If it's a dynamic rigid body. How do I make it a dynamic rigid body? Well, I would want to go to add component and add rigid body 2D, and then also add a box collider 2D. So we clearly need all those components, but in the first place, we need to even get box 2D into our engine. I mean, it's already compiling as part of our engine, but obviously we don't have it um, doing anything whatsoever. So this is now where I'm going to refer to the code that I wrote during the live stream, uh, because I'm obviously don't remember everything that happened. So basically, the first thing we need to do is store a box2d world, right? Again, consult the box2d documentation, but this is called a B2 world. Now, I don't want to include box2d here, because if I do that, scene.h is likely, I mean, it's definitely included by hazelnut, it's, incl it's going to be included by the runtime potentially and stuff like that. I want to keep box2d as like a hazel thing only. So I don't want to have to link box2d and like use, you know, set up the include directories for box2d for every project from here on out that uses Hazel. I want it to be a dependency of Hazel, not of everything that Hazel uses. So because of that, I'm going to do a forward declaration here. So B2 world, right? Has to be outside of the namespace here. I could put it here and just do like a blank namespace, but I'm not, I'm not going to do that. Um, and then we're going to add it as a raw pointer. Yeah, that's right. Um, unfortunately, unique pointers can't be um, incomplete types. So that, otherwise I'd probably use a unique pointer or something. But then again, we are actually manually going to be creating this and destroying this pointer uh, when it comes down to um, starting and ending our runtime, which would be a good, a good place to introduce this. So on runtime start and on runtime stop. So these two functions, which I might hook up immediately so that I don't, so that I don't forget about them. Um, so what does this happen? On scene play, right? So on scene play, We'll do on runtime. There you go, man. There you go, Visual Studio. Okay. <laughs> uh, what is it? It's active scene. Look at that. Active scene on my computer. Just I think my computer is more tired than I am from all the programming today, to be completely honest. On runtime stop. Uh, it doesn't really matter like what order you do it in. I did it in. I did it in the opposite order of this in the dev branch. I'll do it in this order here. Why not? Um, but basically, these two functions, right? which we will implement. Um, these two functions are going to create and destroy our Box2D world. So uh, we'll include Box2D here. So include, um, what is it? Uh, 
box 2D slash B2 underscore world from memory. Not sure why that's not helping me, IntelliSense. IntelliSense has been kind of broken all day anyway. But um, uh, what is it? Box 2D world equals new B2 world. There you go. IntelliSense is back, catching up with me. So gravity, right? It's a B2, it's a B, B2 vec, B2, B, B2 vec2. Box 2D vector 2. So no horizontal, and then we'll use minus 9.8. That's the kind of 9.8, what is it, meters per second, the normal gravity we have, I think, on this planet. I'm not a, not a, not a physics person, so I don't know. Sure, checks out. Um, <laughs> might want to look, might, might want to look that up. Uh, I'll do, I'll call it this physics world, right? Come on. I'm using, like, one of my old keyboards. It's a dust keyboard, I think three, but it's the ultimate version, which has no, like, no, um, the, the keys are blank, basically. It doesn't have any actual letters, text, glyphs, whatever on the keys. So if I miss a key, if I'm just typing, it's fine. But then if I have to press a key and especially a symbol, don't ask me to, because I'll be like, oh no, I'll start doubting myself. It's a disaster. Anyway, probably not great for recording videos, but whatever. Um, so yeah, so we create this Box2D world and this happens, of course, inside our uh, kind of um, on runtime start function. And then what we want to do now is actually go through, okay, well, actually, since, we have, since we've created it, we might as well destroy it. So we basically do delete, and then we'll uh, also set this to null pointer, because of course the scene isn't dying. Um, so we want to make sure that if in case we're debugging or whatever, that it is in fact null pointer, not whatever memory address was left over that we deleted, deleted the, the data from. Um, yeah, so what do we do next? Well, now that we have the world, we want to start adding bodies to it. How do we do that? We call the create body function, but we need to know what entities are actual physics entities that need to be created. So we need to create some kind of physics component. So if we hop on over into our components file, go to the very bottom, I'm going to make a area here called um, just physics, I guess, struct um, let me pop on over into the right file over here as well so that I can see uh, like what I actually did, but we'll call this rigid body 2D component. So everything in Hazel, I'm pretty sure potentially apart from, no, okay, Sprite Render has that as well. Um, they all end in component just so that it's completely clear. Um, but we don't have too many things here. Um, I mean, enum class body type, right? So we have a type for the body. So static, which is zero. Again, I like to explicitly write it just to be on the same page just in case, but it's not really necessary. It should be zero anyway. Static dynamic kinematic. Um, kinematic, I don't think we're gonna deal with that today, but um, so, in other, so in other words, we're not. Um, and then we can actually set it to be, I guess, body type static by default like that. Right. Um, now, the other parameter that we might want is basically whether or not rotation is fixed. So you might want it to not be able to rotate. Right. That's useful to have. Um, and that's kind of it. Now, other things we're going to include here, though, are a little void pointer. This could be a forward declared B2 body pointer. But basically, this is going to be the actual runtime body. So we're going to inside the component itself, we're actually going to store the runtime body. Now, I don't know why necessarily I decided on this architecture. I did this like over a year ago for, for Big Hazel. Um, you could easily have like a map of entity ID. We don't have UUIDs yet for entities, but you could easily have a map of that to these void pointers or to, to B2 body pointers if you wanted to in the scene. So scene could own that. I don't know if shoving it into, into a component is a great idea, but then again, I don't think it matters too much unless you believe in the whole, they should be immutable. I, I don't really know. Um, I think it's fine. This is eight bytes of memory. It's just going to be a pointer to a runtime body so that we can keep track of it through box2d. That's all it is. Um, that's it, right? So after that, we create a default constructor. Um, and again, I just like to be explicit about this. And then we create a copy constructor as well. I guess we can just do that if we wanted to, but um, yeah, I guess what's the point of running other? Um, okay, there you go. So that's the rigid body 2D component. Now I wanna do the same thing now, but we'll do it for the box collider 2D component, right? So this is gonna actually represent the box um, that we are going to, that is our collision box, right? So it does not have to match the sprite, obviously. It can be whatever you want it to be. Um, so let's get rid of this stuff with the exception of, we'll keep this, we'll call this runtime fixture because we'll have to, we will, we, we will want to be able to kind of um, reference that. So we'll, we'll create an offset, which we're not actually going to use today. 
Um, but this will just be for future reference. This is if you want your collider to be offset from the middle of your entity, right? Um, from the from the basically from the transform position. Um, size as well by default, we'll set it up to be 0.5. Um, so this will line up well with a one by one meter sprite, which again, if you create like a sprite renderer component, it's going to be a one by one meter, um, like according to its transform, a one, a one by one scale, I guess, one by one by one scale means that you have a one by one meter object. So this is going to basically follow that convention because these are half extents. So you will still end up with a one by one meter thing. Um, <clears throat> Now, um, the rest of the stuff is basically like physics materials stuff. So we have a density, which I just set to one by default. I don't know if these are good default values. <laughs> it just is what it is. Friction, I think I set to, yeah, 0. 0.5. And then we basically have two things. So we have restitution, which is the bounciness, kind of. It's like something to do with energy and how much is lost. And then also a restitution threshold. So this is important because I think I've set it to 0. 0.5 and then by default, it's not bouncy, right? Yeah, so this is just a threshold at which velocity, again, the docs explain this greatly. Um, the it, what this is is the velocity at which it stops like calculating the bounciness because as you can imagine if you drop something on a table it could keep bouncing in like forever right infinitely because it's just going to keep like bouncing um, and we don't want the physics engine to have to keep calculating that and we'll get weird jitters like so you usually just set this to like something decent where it's like okay well if the speed has fallen below this amount I don't know if 0.5 is a decent value whatever seem to visually look fine um, and you can obviously tweak this that's the point of exposing this value but um, this basically just means that uh, it's not going to it's, it's going to just quit after a while be like, okay, no more bouncing, which is, I think, important. Um, all right, that's it. So this stuff, I'll add the same to do I did in the dev branch, which was um, basically move into physics material in the future, maybe, <laughs> um, so that we move this uh, basically into an actual physics material, because that's kind of what it is. So now that we have those two components, right? we can basically do the rest of the code here. Now we still need to set up the UI and the serialization for those components, right? So remind me, um, this is not a live stream, but remind me <laughs> um, from the past. So back into scene, right? How do we set this stuff up? Well, basically once we have our physics world, we, re we really just need to go through somehow. So we'll use a view to go through our entity component system through our registry um, and basically look at all of the rigid body yeah, definitely that rigid body 2D components that we have, right? So for auto, uh, we'll do E um, in view, and then we'll immediately just create like a hazel entity out of it. So E, and then I think this, right? Um, so that we can like use our own API, I guess, which is like a wrapper over um, ent over entity. So once we have that, um, we need to basically pull some data. So what are we trying to do? We're trying to create bodies into the physics world. We're trying to create some bodies at particular locations with particular sizes, set up their colliders, do all of that stuff. So we obviously need to pull the transform out. So we'll do transform equals E get component. Uh, do we actually have, no. Uh, why is this so difficult? Um, do we have, no, okay. So in, I think in Hazel, in um, proper Hazel, we have a dot transform function that we can just use and it's shorthand for pulling out the transform component just because it's such a common thing to do. But we'll basically, and this is obviously with entity. So entity get component transform, uh, RB2D, rigid body 2D. So this is our rigid body 2D component, which we just made. Um, what else do we need? That's probably it. So now we can actually start creating a body. So in order, in order to be able to actually do create body, you can see we need a body def. That's like a body definition, right? So um, basically B2 body def, right? This is our body definition. And then we can start filling it out. Now, I think we'll probably have to like include body. And while we're here, we might as well include fixture. Probably it. Do we need like shape? We're going to use a box collider. So is there like a shape? Polygon shape, I think we'll use. Yeah, include everything. So this is all the box 2D stuff. Um, so we to, will pass that in. So it just takes it in as a const pointer like that. It's going to copy all the stuff internally, I'm pretty sure. Well, it, it definitely does because this will go out of scope, obviously. Um, and then we basically set up all the stuff we need to for a body. So the main things in the body, again, are things that we have here, the type and the rotation. And that's 
that's it from the rigid body component. But then from the transform component, we need to set the position of it and stuff like that. But the first thing we probably care about is the type, right? So to set this type, um, I think it's good to like create a little conversion function so that we don't have to have if statements or a switch case in here, because we need to now convert from our kind of Hazel type static dynamic kinematic to box 2D's type. I don't know if the enum will line up because you could just like type pun it or copy the value or whatever, reinterpret it, whatever you want. Yeah, you you could static kinematic dynamic. Um, we define it in a different order as will be different. I don't like you could. So I'll show you how to do that. I'm not going to do that just because I like to be a bit more explicit with my conversions. But basically what you could do is basically take our rigid body 2D, because they're just integers, obviously, and just be like, no, 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 it's this. Done, right? I don't think it'll let you apply this just because they will show up as different types, but if you cast it, it will be fine. Um, you could do that. Again, in this case, we we would have to switch dynamic and kinematic, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to write a conversion function. So to do that, we'll just do static. Um, what's the actual type? B2 body type. Um, we'll do hazel. Uh, what did I call the function? Hazel rigid body 2D type to box 2D, <laughs> to box 2D type basically. So, um, so this will be a rigid body 2D component body type. So this is the uh, body type. We're taking that in and we're converting it here. So you can just do a switch statement for this, of course, body type. And then what do we do? Case body type static will return static. Um, so yeah, this is just a bit nicer in general, just because you don't have to worry about, um, you know, this is kind of, since we've defined our own types for it, it's nice to be a little bit more in control with conversions just in case they change stuff around. Cause obviously they assume if you use an enum, it doesn't really matter what the value is unless you serialize it. And then again, I, I like serializing enum values as strings rather than as numbers, unless you are doing a binary format for runtime, that's fine. But in terms of like for an editor, definitely serialize it as a string, because that way um, it doesn't really matter, um, you know, what's up. Uh, so we'll core assert false because that's an unknown type. Unknown body type. I don't know, do we need a dot, a full stop? No. Um, and we'll just return a thing just so it's happy. But yeah, so now that we've got this, we can convert from, um, I guess I won't call this Hazel because we are Hazel, right? Rigid body 2D type, that's Hazel's one, obviously, to box 2D uh, type, to box 2D body. Um, so now that we've got that, we can, of course, do this instead. It's a little bit more robust than just assuming that the, in um, we'll line up. Um, and also, in case you're wondering why we don't use, why, why we don't just use box 2D's types here, I just don't like to, just because I don't, I don't like to be dependent on that, right? Like if we decide that we want to change um, over to use like not box 2D for whatever reason, you know, there's a lot of box 2D references all around the code. I like to be a little bit more kind of ab abstract, I guess, a bit further away from implementation details. So we just roll our own stuff and then, you know, we can add translation when necessary. Obviously this stuff is, it's not like gonna affect performance or anything. We're in runtime start and we're doing a little, little a light, light little conversion. So everything's fine. It's gonna be another monster episode. Well, it was a four hour live stream. What do you expect? Uh, but, um, but at least we're getting we're getting stuff done, you know, for Hazel 2D, which I, which I think is important because I'm getting a bit fed up with how long it's taking us to get to anything uh, at least capable of making a small game. So um, the position now. So the position obviously coming from the transform, it's great that we store stuff like not as matrices because it's just so easy to grab these values. We don't need to decompose anything. I mean, translation is a bad example because that's easy to get from a matrix regardless, but stuff like scale and rotation especially, um, it's so nice when it's just stored like this. Um, speaking of rotation, we'll also set the angle. Notice that's just a float, of course, because we're in 2D physics land. So this will simply be, um, what, transform.rotation.z basically, transform.rotation.z. All right, so that's our body def pretty much done, I think. Now we can actually create the body by passing in that body def and we have our body ready to go. We need to pull that out though. So B2 body pointer, um, we'll just call this body, I guess. 
Uh, so this, this is gonna be our actual body that we wanna store back in the component when we wrote it, right? So we have a runtime body. So this just keeps track of it during runtime, otherwise it's null pointer, right? Um, so, uh, oh, and finally we need to actually set fixed rotation. This happens in the, um, like in the body, not the body def. So what is it gonna be? RB2D dot fixed rotation. There's a lot of other stuff, by the way. I'm arbitrarily picking stuff. I don't know even how I came up came up with what gets included, what doesn't. But like, if you look at set fixed rotation, like there's, um, you know, we can have enabled disabled. There's obviously fixture list, there's joints. There's a lot of stuff to do, right? Um, and obviously even like stuff in Hazel that already does exist in in the in the in big hazel is like stuff like contactlessness, so being able to get callbacks into your scripts when collisions occur, triggers, stuff like that. That's all ahead of us. We will get there probably one day. But for now, obviously starting with the first pass. Um yeah, and now that we've got this, we can go back into that thing and set that runtime body to just be the body, right? It's a void pointer because we, we don't want to include box2d there. Again, nothing wrong with just making a forward declaration like we did here. Um, that's okay, I think, but I just kept it as a void pointer, whatever. It doesn't really matter. We know what it is. Um, it's not a big deal. Now, we could go through this again, except this time checking for box collider 2d stuff. Um, but instead of that, I'm just going to do if, and again, it's from an entity component system. I don't know if this is what this is might be worse than just iterating through all of them in a row, but this is on runtime start, not a big deal. I think could change it later if we need to, but it's just code wise is a lot. It's a lot better to just have it here. So we'll just do, um, if entity has component box collider 2d component, we can add an actual box kind of, uh, collider to it basically. So we'll get that box collider. 2D component from it, which will be entity get component, this, right? Um, and then we can start creating an actual shape out of it. So B2 polygon shape, that's what I included earlier. Um, so we'll make the actual, uh, I guess, polygon shape, could have called it shape, I guess, uh, shape.set as box. And then we set the half extents and you can see it says half width, half height. They're even labeled HX, HY. So, we could obviously just set this to be the uh, X and the Y, right? And oh, there is a center. So we can actually pass the offset into here. That's cool. I didn't realize that during the live stream. But basically, um, there's even an overload. What's the other one? Oh, right. We center an angle. Oh, but that's an oriented box. This is an axis aligned box. Mm, we won't play with this just, just yet. Um, so we'll basically, we, we could just set this to be the uh, size.x and then the size.y. Um, which is fine. But what I want to do is I want to make this not just like an absolute size that we set because, you know, I mean, intuitively, you'd want to be able to just resize your box, your renderable box in the actual engine by just dragging like on the scale and making the scale larger and you're know, making it a non-uniform scale or whatever. I want to, you know, build some walls and stuff like that. And then I don't want to manually go into the box collider 2D component and then, I don't know, be like, oh, okay, now it's 20 meters tall. So I guess I'll manually set the Y to be 10. Like that's just silly, right? So instead of doing that, um, we what we do since we are already kind of living in a situation where like we have scale and we're in a one by one, like, you know, one, a scale of one means one meter. So clearly half of this means half of that and the half extents work and stuff like that. So because of that, I, I'm like, I think it's a great idea to basically just be like, you know what, transform.scale.x, I'll multiply this with this size X and stuff like that, right? So might do it the other way around. Um, just so there's a bit more clear in the code. But uh, you know, if we multiply with scale, it means that we automatically get that scale value in here. We'll change it to Y and everything's fine. Now, if you wanna modify that, so you want it to be like a, uh, you know, maybe different, like twice the scale or whatever, you can do that. And I think if, if people really have an issue with this, you can easily add a little checkbox to be like, don't use scale or use scale um, and then have a check by default or whatever. And then that way you can not do this here. Um, but otherwise, you know, if you want to, if you just want a custom hard coded value, of course it can be a little bit difficult to do. But again, if you have a scale of one, you can have whatever value you want because you'll multiply with one. So I don't know, I think it's good to do this. Uh, it just makes a lot more sense when you're actually, you know, using the engine. Unity does this, I'm, I'm fairly sure. 
Um, okay, so now we set up the fixture. So the fixture is going to contain this shape that we just made, our little polygon shape, right? Um, I guess we should call this a box shape, actually, because that makes more sense. Um, and then all of the kind of material stuff that I just talked about, right? So stuff like the density, the friction, you know, all of that stuff. So where do we get it from? We get it from that box collider. Again, that's why I put it there. Might have made more sense to put it onto the actual rigid body, but you can see that Box2D stores it in the fixture, which the fixture needs the shape, right? So it's all kind of, you know, connected, I guess. So we'll get the density from there. Then we'll get the friction. Uh, then what else is there? The restitution and the restitution threshold, right? So once we've got all of this stuff, restitution, um, restitution threshold and friction, right? We just create the fixture. So we go body, which we still have because we're up here. That's another good example of like why I kind of did it all in one for loop, not in several kind of uh, iterations going through different components, just because we already have everything here. It makes sense. Um, create fixture and then we'll pass in that fixture def. All right, fantastic. So that is pretty much it for runtime start. I don't think that's anything else that we need to do. So that's fantastic. We've created all of the entities within Box2D itself. We've got those um, you know, beautiful orange lines that I drew earlier. So now what do we have to do every frame? Well, usually you, you would wanna do this after you update the scripts. I think at least in Hazel, we like to do physics after we do the script. So like with PhysX and for 3D physics, we do it after. The reason being the way that I kind of justify this in my head is just that the script can control the physics. The script might be like, I want to add an impulse. I want to add a force. And obviously that will not get picked up until the next frame, unless you actually um, do the calculation after you do that, right? So in other words, what you're kind of, the thing you're kind of playing with here is the, the render order, right? Versus like the, you know, the script S and then the physics. So if you do script physics render, then the script affects the physics and you can already see that in the render. Otherwise, if you do physics script render, right, then obviously the physics will happen. You'll add your impulse, but you'll render obviously from the physics. So you won't get that impulse until the next frame. So that's kind of how I, that's why I did it that way. Um, again, I don't know what arguments people have. I didn't think about it for too long, to be honest, but whatever. So, you know, uh, physics. So um, we'll probably start using, st stop using like 2D all the time because this is a 2D engine. But like for this, I want to make it clear that this is a box collider 2D and that's 2D just because, just because I want to. <laughs> um, so how do we do this? So I, I kind of arbitrarily, I think this comes from the, either the documentation from box 2D or possibly it's from the uh, one of their examples. But basically we have velocity and position iterations. This is basically con controlling the granularity of the physics simulation. So how much is it stepping? How, how often is it doing calculations between moving and stuff like that? If you increase this, performance is gonna go down, but the precision will go up. So I don't know what good values are. This is definitely open for debate. And I think that you should definitely probably expose this to the editor in some kind of physics settings because it will definitely depend on what kind of game you're making and uh, you know what app you're making, what simulate, what scene you have and stuff like that. So we pass in the time step, which is just TS. And then obviously what we just created, velocity iterations, position iterations. Whew, all right, so next up is to basically retrieve those rigid bodies from the world so that we can actually, uh, you know, update them. So what do we have to update? Well, we've just stepped the physics world, which means we've simulated the physics. So now obviously the positions of things have moved around, right? The positions of these orange things have moved around. So now we have to grab those transforms so that the white squares so that we actually render all of our entities in the right place. So to do that, um, you know, we'll go through uh, auto um, E in view, just like we did before. Um, uh, so yeah, I'll, I guess I'll make that clear. So retrieve uh, transform from box 2D, right? So uh, we'll make that entity like we did before and E this, uh, and then we'll just, we'll basically scroll up here and get the transform and the rigid body 2D components because we need those. And then that's kind of like it, like it's really quite simple. All we have to do is grab that physics body, which remember we are now nicely storing inside here. So we can just do um, runtime body. That's a void pointer. I'm gonna cast it back to one of these. You guys can use static cast or interpret cast if you want. We had a discussion during the live stream and I kind of agreed that 
you know, I just like C's, I just like C's style cast. I think it's fine and I think it's necessary um, to write static cast or, or, or reinterpret cast here. Um, this is a void pointer and we're just casting back to here. Um, now, if you didn't store it on the component, this is where you'd probably want to also retrieve maybe the entity UUID or whatever, and then be like, hey, scene, you know, give me my entity box 2D body map. And then I want to, um, you know, I want to get my entity ID and then that way you could kind of get your body. That's the only other way I can really think of doing it. Um, sure, right? But the data's already here. It's already hot in the cache, I guess, because we're going through this anyway and which we need to get the values out anyway from the component, I guess. So I don't know. <laughs> I think it's fine. Um, I, I guess we don't really, like we do need to go through the rigid body 2D component to know what even to set, what entities to set, but um, I don't know. I think it's fine doing it this way. All right. And it's not that I sound like, you know, insecure or defensive of my strategy. I'm just literally thinking out loud. That's all. Um, I don't really care. Like I'm happy for people to correct me, obviously. So now we get the position from the body. So get position. I'm purely using this const reference as an alias. If you look at get position, it returns a const reference of this. I just don't want to write get position twice. That's all. Um, this will probably all be inlined anyway, obviously. So uh, transform.translation. Uh, X, right? So we can set that X translation to be position.x, right? That's from box 2D. And then we do the same for Y. So we're just copying the X and Y position from box 2D into our transform component, thus changing our transform component. Pretty wild stuff, I know. Um, and then we'll do the same thing for the rotation. So the Z rotation will now be position, not position, obviously, will now be body, I think it's get angle, right? Because that's what we called it. And that's it. And the, this angle, I think, is a float, right? So there we go. There's our angle. We've got the rotation Z. Everything looks brilliant. And believe it or not, guys, that's actually it. Um, that's actually it. We need to program all the UI, but fundamentally, functionally, that is actually it. So let's try and build this. I know it's going to fail because of a few annoying things, but we'll still build it. Um, see how far we get, I guess. Um, okay, that succeeded. I'm surprised because I thought we were missing some like of these annoying things, <laughs> but whatever. I don't think we're actually calling out a component yet. That's why. Um, so how do we add, com add this stuff, right? We'll do the serialization last. We'll start with the, um, with the scene hierarchy. Right, so we obviously need to be able to um, add these actual entities. So how do we add like a camera? Sorry, not entities, components. So we have add components. This is one thing that annoyed me during the live stream. Why on earth would we um, have this set up? I did, I'm, I don't know if I wrote this or not. I don't remember. I don't care. But you know, in this case, it's like if you don't have the component, add it. Otherwise, just write something. Don't add the component, obviously, and just write a little log message. That's weird. What we should do is not even present that as an option if the component already exists, right? And by the way, if we want to have multiple box collider components, that needs to be a completely different system. So we'll talk about that later when we get there. But um, that's definitely like, I guess there are use cases for that. And it's probably best to have like a box 2D collider or like a, um, a box collider collection component or something that contains many, you know, shapes and, and box colliders within it. That's probably how I would do it. But yeah, if we don't have that, then we'll add that. And also cleans up the code, which is nice doing it this way. Um, so let's do that, right? All good. Now we'll copy this and we'll give ourselves a way to add both a rigid body component, right? So rigid body, rigid body 2D, uh, as well as a box collider 2D component. I should, um, just low key check my disk space and stuff because I always get annoyed. Like I always get worried and stressed about these long videos just failing to record or whatever. Hate that. <laughs> Box Collider 2D and uh, Rigid Body 2D, right? Box Collider, okay, that looks good. Um, so now we have the ability to add it, but we want to obviously tweak the UI and stuff. So let's go ahead and the hardest one's probably going to be, uh, let's copy the camera one. The reason being that, well, actually we'll copy the sprite renderer but then we'll grab some stuff from camera because we have a drop down box, right? And they're always fun to do because we have this like checkbox. It's not not checkbox, but we have to be able to to actually um, select what body type we use. So we have static, we have dynamic, 
Uh, and we have a lot of this I'm doing from memory, by the way, just because I'm, um, well, this is UI stuff, it's easy, but I just did this a few hours ago. I'm gonna be, have dreams about box 2D and stuff, yay. Um, so body type, body type strings, current body type string, body type strings, um, and then component. So this is uh, coming from component dot, um, so doing sprite render component. So this is, oh, I better not be modifying the actual sprite render component. Good, I'm not. So this is the rigid body 2D component. Component dot type, I think. This is useless. <laughs> yep, type. Cast to an int. Um, the getting that stuff out, current body type. So this is our body type. We'll put in our current body type. So basically current projection string gets replaced with that and projection type string gets replaced with body type strings. And everything else should work apart from setting it. So to set it, we just do component dot uh, body dot type equals, um, this is slightly annoying, but rigid body telesense being useless as usual. Although I did misspell that, I guess. <laughs> body type uh, I, right? Um, that's it, I think. I don't think I did anything with cameras or projections. I don't think I left anything there. Whatever. We'll debug it, if anything. So that looks good. That's our body type. Um, what else do we have inside that rigid body component? So just, just fixed rotation is the only other thing, which is kind of nice. So I think this is just a checkbox. We really need to redo this UI as well because we've still got labels on the right side and need to integrate some new UI. If you guys haven't seen the new UI, by the way, I'll have it linked up there um, if I remember, but it's the latest kind of Hazel devlog. Um, check that out. It looks so good. And we're going to start probably bringing some of that back into here as well. So uh, what is this fixed rotation? Um, so let's see. Thanks for the help. Oh no. Oh no. My whole computer is frozen. <sighs> okay, so I almost just had a heart attack because my computer froze, just mouse would not move for like a few minutes. But the I stopped the recording and the recording uh, after it unfroze and the recording is safe. I was almost about, a I was an hour and eight minutes into that recording, man, if that, no, it's not good for my heart. <laughs> anyway, let's get back to it. So uh, at least I have the first part saved. I wouldn't mind resuming from here if I had to. Anyway, so component fixed rotation. Um, that's easy enough. So, <laughs> so we've got that going. Um, now we just need to do the same kind of thing, but for the uh, box collider stuff. So box collider 2D component. box collider 2d don't need any of this stuff obviously uh it's actually pretty simple we just need to basically have um an i am gui like drag float 2 i guess for the so yeah all, all this stuff from here basically so let's maybe just kind of display that side by side or something um so that we can quickly see it nothing really to do here so we'll have uh offset which will be glm value pointer component dot offset. Um, then we'll have a size, density, friction. And these are just drag floats. Density, friction, restitu restitution, and restitution threshold. That's it, right? Okay. So these are all just component dot. Uh, now, because restitution, so if you read the docs, right? Um, restitution, hard word. Um, if you read the docs, then you'll see that um, these values, like threshold not, but like these values are mostly between like zero and one, right? Actually, I think it's not even the docs. I think it's just like the code that, that says that. So if you look at like density or whatever, no, that's our density. Um, 
it says that like, yeah, usually in the range zero one, so friction, restitution. So you don't have to lock it to zero one, because again, usually in the range means that like, not necessarily, you know, it, like it could for whatever special effects you might want to exceed that range. But again, like, I don't know if it's worth locking in and having a button that's like unlock, because again, for most purposes, you might want to lock it. Um, but yeah, I think what we'll do is we will lock it for now. So 0 0.01 will be the speed and then 0 1 will do. All right, same for friction, same for restitution, but for the threshold, um, we'll have zero as the minimum. Um, so this is speed, so 0 0.1 speed, zero minimum, and we won't have a maximum. Um, cause yeah. Okay. That's it. I think I know weird checkbox here, but that's basically it. Oh, like offset, offset everywhere. Yeah. Basically it. Well done, Cherno. Um, so component dot density. This all needs to be removed. Uh, density, we've got restitution and we just have, we just need friction. Okay. So that's basically it. I think, um, have we just done like everything that we need, needed to do? I feel like we might, we may have. So let's go ahead and hit F5 and see what happens. Um, again, serialization is the big thing we haven't done yet. We want to be able to save our components. Okay, this is what I was talking about. So we need to have, um, I don't know why I did this, man. I was a bit, I was kind of upset, <laughs> upset at myself on stream for doing this at some point, I guess. But like, why do we even have these? I guess if we want to trigger these events when they get, when certain components get added like this, but I don't know, they're kind of enforced everywhere which is weird. Maybe we should make them optional somehow. I don't know. It's just going to try and call it. And if it can't find the, if it can't find the function, it's linking error. So it's not the best thing. Um, but anyway, uh, we'll just, we'll just shut up and add them here in this case. Copy that across. Um, and yeah, now we should be able to, I don't know if we've done everything correctly. I haven't really referred to my notes much. <laughs> just had the screen recorder <laughs> here so I can make sure everything's recording. Um, but uh, if we go to scenes physics 2D, if we hit play, will we will we see it fall? That's the moment of truth, guys. Are you ready? Play. I failed. I failed you all. Oh, no, no. No, I haven't failed anyone. I haven't added the components yet. <laughs> so add component, rigid body 2D, add component box collider 2D. So rigid body 2D over here, we'll set it to be a dynamic um, body, of course. We'll leave everything else as default. Now let's hit play. I didn't fail anyone. Okay, cool. Now notice how when I hit stop, it's gone. It's not actually gone. It's just down here because obviously um, at the moment when we hit play, it plays the existing scene. There's no resetting scenes. Usually what you do, what what you would want to do and what we do in Hazel and Big Hazel is we copy the entire scene when we hit play. So it's like a new scene. It's like a runtime scene that you're playing. And then that way you delete that scene when you hit stop and you fall back to the editor scene. Uh, so that's how we do it. And that's probably what we'll do here, maybe next episode, because that is definitely important. But yeah, let's add another entity. We can't save any of this, which is annoying. We should probably add serialization first, but it, but just, just to kind of test it, we'll add another entity. Um, we'll, uh, let's just, uh, we move this down a little bit. I'll actually add like a non-uniform kind of scale. So we'll test that out if that works. Maybe let's back the camera back a little bit more. Uh, and then I'll add a, a box collider to it and I will add um, a rigid body 2D to it. We'll make it static this time. Let's hit play. There you go, right? It sits on the box, amazing. And of course we could uh, rotate this and it will kind of roll, that's great. Um, and then also let's do one more thing. Might back that camera up even more. It'd be nice to have like a picture in picture for the camera so we can see what it sees. But the other thing we'll do is uh, maybe, um, well, let's set the restitution of this a bit higher, right? It's like 0.5. So now it should bounce. Hey, it's a bit bouncy now, right? So that's it. Basically you can see it all working. Um, did not take that much time, did it? Um, yeah, pretty easy to do. The gizmos are using the wrong camera, but yeah, that's how little bouncy world. Now we can't duplicate entities either, right? Which would be great because we'll probably add that next episode when we actually add the um, scene copying and stuff, because a lot of the same code can be used to duplicate entities. But uh, yeah, that's basically it. So we can't save. That's our last thing. So how do we save? Well, saving, very easy, right? 
um, we just need to manually add the stuff into scene serializer. Now, again, if we had some kind of automatic reflection system, probably wouldn't be the worst thing in the world because it would save us a lot of manual code. But on the other hand, I kind of like the simplicity of this stuff. Um, you know, we don't have to have anything crazy. People understand how this system works. Um, and obviously once you kind of have your components in place, like it's just something you do for components. So I don't know, I'm a bit, I'm a bit torn. Um, I kind of like it to be honest. Um, so uh, RB2D component. So we'll retrieve this component if it has it, of course. Um, and then we just need to serialize all the values, which again, we just have static dynamic kinematic um, and then fixed rotation, right? But the thing is with the body type, I want to serialize it as a string, not an integer. And I mentioned this before, just in case we rearrange stuff or we like, I mean, it's not that bad here. These are kind of fixed, right? But in general, it's it also makes it easier to read the actual YAML file if it's text. And of course it's YAML. So we're, we're trying to make it easy to read, easy to merge, you know, human readable and writable even. So uh, it's nice to kind of do that. So let's add a little function probably up here. Um, and we'll call this, so std string, um, this will be a uh, rigid body 2D uh, body type, I guess, rigid body 2D body type to string body type, body type. And then I'll kind of do the same thing, but this will be a from string because we'll obviously need that as well. This will kind of just be rearranged. Body type string. Um, okay, so how's this gonna work? Well, uh, we'll just do a switch for this case. So body type case um, static will return static uh, dynamic kinematic. Uh, we'll return an empty string and assert. I don't know why this would happen. Um, anyway, memory corruption maybe. <laughs> Catch some like memory corruption bugs. All right, so there you go. Static dynamic kinematic. Um, and then uh, for this though, because there's strings and string comparison stuff, we can't use switch statements. So we'll just do uh, if the body type string is static, return this. Static dynamic kinematic. Return just static, I guess, and assert. If it's for some reason, neither of these. Okay, easy. So now uh, we do a two string for the serialization. So it's going to be this body type or just type. Um, and then finally for the fixed rotation, we'll just do the fixed rotation. Um, that's good. Uh, now we'll do the same thing for the box collider. But again, we can't save. It's the stupidest thing. I don't know how we didn't end up having a save button. Whatever, this episode's already long anyway. Might as well just, you know. Hope you guys are appreciating this series. <laughs> um, yeah, lots of time. That's okay. I'm enjoying myself, I guess. Uh, box collider 2D, box collider 2D component. And when we have, uh, what do we even have in that? We've got quite a lot of stuff. So offset size. So I don't think we have any, um, and again, I've been through this in the live stream. So when I say, I don't think I am, I'm sure I'm just pretending that I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I don't know why, but, uh, we don't have any vector two kind of functions. So if you look up, we have vector three, vector four, we don't support kind of serializing vector twos. So we'll add that in. Uh, it's pretty simple. We'll just get rid of Z and we're done. Um, and then finally, we'll do the same thing for like decoding them basically. So can this kind of convert node as well. So two, two, get rid of this, two, get rid of this, two, right? And that's it. 
pretty simple. So now we can serialize and deserialize vec twos pretty easily. <clears throat> um, where was all this stuff? Uh, offset size. Uh, and what else do we have? So yeah, density friction. Density friction restitution restitution threshold, and I'll just copy that. And that looks good. Okay, that's it. That's our box glider component done. Uh, now, obviously, the deserializing stage. So, rigid body 2D component. Uh, so, rigid body 2D. What do we have? Runtime body, not <laughs> runtime body. The the perfect thing to serialize. So rigid body to d uh, from string, right? So we we read in the string. Um. Uh, body type, right? Dot uh, as a city string. Then we convert it. Um, fixed rotation. as bool, that's it. And then for the box collider 2D component, box collider 2D. So what do we have in there? Um, Make sure we do that. So uh, I guess offset is the first thing, right? GLM vec2. Have another vec2, which is the size. And then the rest of floats. Starting with density, friction, restitution. Sure, restitution. Threshold and restitution. Okay, so in there we go. I feel like I'm falling asleep <laughs> doing this code. I don't know if you guys are like, you know, watching this on two times speed or just skipping it entirely. <laughs> I'll try and put chapters if I don't forget in the uh, description so that they show up and that you can navigate this easy and skip this boring part. But I think that's it. So now we can save it kind of. We just don't have a control S button, but whatever. We'll add, the, we'll add that stuff next time because I think that it's going to be... Um, it's going to be like, you know, we'll add all the scene functionality. We'll add um, being able to duplicate entities. We'll add the save scene stuff. So it'll make sense to kind of just do that all in one episode, I think. Um, okay. Uh, what's going on with our editor? Oh, I have this window on top for some reason. So um, physics 2D. We're back to having nothing. That's great. Let's try and build out our scene again. So add rigid body, add box collider. Um, we'll set this to be dynamic, uh, and then let's create our floor. So I'll call this floor. Um, I'll add a sprite renderer, a rigid body, basically all the components of a camera. Um, we'll make this static. Um, I'll probably change the color to like orange because I like orange. That's what we had in the other demo, I'm fairly sure. Um, make this like this. Um, make this maybe a bit smaller. Um, and then obviously make this, yeah, static and all that stuff. Now let's save this, so save as, and then we'll just overwrite physics 2D. Yes, play, there you go, right? So we have our kind of scene, um, we'll move this away. Obviously we can uh, play with this. Uh, we can also try and make it like longer. Um, you know, it should work, I guess, because we obviously played with that. Um, also, uh, I guess we'll check out the friction. So if we make this, rotated how how does it slide so it doesn't slide at the moment but if we lower the friction so 0 0.5 um let's make it like 0 0.1 maybe then you can see it slides now right so the sliding's there let's rescue it <laughs> uh and yeah i think that's pretty much it you guys probably get it don't need to just sit here playing with it um i'll push this well it's already on the dev branch but it'll also be in the main branch now so I'll, i will push this you guys can play with it at home if you like 
Um, but yeah, uh, bounce in is probably the last thing we didn't really touch since we did the changes, but let's go to, yeah, let's just make it kind of bouncy. I'll make it a bit bigger, maybe. No, that's, that's too big. Um, density is probably also useful to play with. <laughs> Makes it a bit more crazy. Anyway, um, that's basically it, right? So I uh, hope you enjoyed the episode. Yeah, you got to have it on a bit of an angle, otherwise, lol. There you go. Fun times. So that's how it works. Um, again, if we had duplicating functionality, we'll play with this more next time. We can set up an entire maze. Um, otherwise, making these entities from, from scratch is really annoying. Um, but yeah, that's it. So again, I'll, I'll save this, uh, Physics 2D, and then I'm going to load like Pink Cube, right? And then I'll go back to Physics 2D, and we have all of our stuff, and it works right? So that is it. Hope you guys enjoyed this video, this very long video of us doing 2D physics. Um, Box 2D, uh, again, not that difficult to implement, I think. Um, you know, we went from scratch to having it in, you know, if you know what, if you know what, you, what, what you're doing, it's quite quick. But obviously, if you're doing it for the, for the first time, it will take longer. It took me longer the first time I did it, obviously, um, which was years ago. But uh, hopefully this was kind of beneficial to you guys, not just if you're following along with Hazel and you want to learn, but also maybe for your own engines like that. Um, again, nothing really to it. Just need to know kind of what you're doing, which the documentation is a perfect place for. So don't skip the docs. Read the docs at least a little bit. Learn to read, not just copy code. Um, it's very, it'll help you out in the long run, I promise you. But anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, please don't forget to hit the like button, Patreon slash the channel best way to help support the series get access to hazel uh 3d to the full version kind of of hazel to the to to not just hazel 2d but you know all of the massive work that's gone into that um and obviously help support this series as well if there were no patrons supporting hazel the big version there would be no hazel little version or hazel 2d right or at least it wouldn't be, wouldn't be at this stage um at all so thank you huge thank you to everyone for supporting this of course i'll be back with a live stream next thursday Australian time as usual. But until then, have a great rest of your day and I'll see you guys next time. Goodbye.